Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Today, we want to focus on the principle of kingdom law and righteousness. Say that with me. The principle of kingdom law and righteousness. We want to really zero in on understanding the principle and power of law. Kingdom law and righteousness. These two words go together. I want to begin with some very simple statements that every human being should learn. There are 6.7 billion people on earth today and most of them will die as failures. God has no pleasure in that reality. So I want to focus first of all on this concept of success. Every human being wants to be successful. Am I right? I've never met anyone who was working hard on a plan to fail. People don't plan to fail. Whether it is their physical health, their relationships, their marriage, their parenting, their business, their jobs, their investments, we don't plan to fail. We all want to succeed then that very hunger leads me to the next point and make a note of this success is predictable write that down success is predictable this statement is amazing most of the time you don't need a profit You know what you're doing. We look for prophecies when they are unnecessary. Here you are, 14 years old, smoking a cigarette. I can prophesy to you. In 20 years, you'll probably have cancer on a lung that looks like charcoal. I prophesy. You don't need a prophecy if you start smoking at 14. Here you are, 16 years old, at a nightclub drinking Dubonnet. Or is it standard? I don't know what they drink today. Some of you are professionals, tell me. Everybody's afraid to answer, right? <laughs> I see that, Mr. Butler. <laughs> we all know the future if you start drinking at 14 years old. You don't need a prophet. In other words, success is predictable, but the next statement is even more shocking. Failure is predictable. If you are not succeeding in life, I believe that we give the devil too much credit. I am certain that the devil many times sit outside your house crying, wondering why you're blaming him for everything that you yourself have imposed on your own life. Success is predictable and failure is predictable because both of them are the result of the same thing. Let me put another thought then to hang your hat on. Life is designed for your success. As a matter of fact, all of life is designed to succeed. God built into everything its own success. A fish is wired to swim. A fish has built into it the law of swim 
in water. Built in. Fish don't need to pray to swim. A seed is designed to bring forth a tree. The law of germination and growth is in the seed, not in heaven. God put it in the seed, which means that the results of the seed obeying the laws of nature guarantees the extension of a tree from that seed. Which means that the success of a seed is predictable. The law is built in. Now let me explain something to you that I thought you may want to remember. And that is God is committed to the success of everything that he created. Make a note of that please. This is what changed my life as a teenager. I figured it out early. Some folks take 40, 50 years to figure this out. I figured out as a teenager that God is predictable. And everything God created is predictable. There's no mystery about what God has created and how it's supposed to function. God designed everything in nature to succeed. And he wants it to succeed. Why? Oh, this is so good. Because... If it doesn't succeed, it embarrasses God. You know, I think that a manufacturer who makes a product, <laughs> he puts his name on it. Now, I was sitting down watching television the last couple of weeks, the news, which is my favorite program. And I'm sitting there watching the news, CNN and MSNBC, and I'm watching the son of the founder of Toyota sitting before the Congress. He's from Japan. He comes to another country, sits in front of a whole government, and apologizes. Now listen carefully. Why did he apologize? First he began by saying, I am here today because my name is on a car that killed a person. He tied the accident that killed a person to his name. His last name is Toyota. He's the son of the founder. He leaves his country. In other words, it is so serious. His name is in trouble. He comes to America to save his name. Why? His name is on the product. And the product failed. When a manufacturer makes a product, he is committed to its success, not because he likes the customer. You're slow. Mr. Toyota doesn't know the person who got killed. He had no idea who they are. So what would make him travel from Japan, sit before the Congress of the United States, and spend a whole day explaining how he's going to correct things? Because he is more interested in his name. When you put your name upon something, its success guarantees protection of your own name. Blessed is he who comes with the name of the Lord on him. Uh, what makes me dangerous on earth is I keep telling people God made me. Y'all don't understand how important that statement is. I keep telling people I came down from heaven. I'm a product of heaven. That puts pressure on heaven. Every time you tell people Jesus Christ is my Lord, the word Lord means owner, you're putting pressure on the Lord. 
I like what Jesus said. If you confess me before the marketplace, I will have to make sure I confess you to the manufacturer. Because if you tell them my name is on you, I got to make sure that the company makes sure you succeed. Because you're going to mess up my name if you fail. Tell your neighbor, I have to succeed. Success is not a personal issue. It's a company issue. Why would a manufacturer send with his product a book? He put it in the box. And when you open the box, you don't see the product first. You see the book. And the book always says, always says, before attempting to operate this product, please read this completely. How many of you do that? Don't you dare hold up your hand. Don't lie before God. There are manuals in your house that are collecting dust. That is why that VCR you bought 20 years ago, the clock is still blinking today. In other words, the manufacturer sends that book to protect his name. He wants that product to be operated perfectly correctly according to the read my lips laws laid down by the manufacturer it's amazing in every manual there are two pages one that says caution the other one says operating instructions now the caution page is the page that have these words do not do not do not now we hate do nots do not commit adultery do not fornicate oh, oh here I go and I'm getting in trouble here do not lie do not steal do not go to work late and say that you have someone to punch the clock for you do not do not we hate the do nots but every manual have to have a do not list then the other page says you can, you can, you can. The manual must have both. When you violate the do not list, the manufacturer cancels its warranty. Warranty is guarantee of the manufacturer to protect his own product. There's a page in the manual in the back. It's the one that we never read. It's called Warranty Guarantee. And there's usually a card that comes with it, a little card. And they say, fill this out and send it back to us. How many of you have filled out and send it back to us? Oh, Jesus. Y'all are honest people, at least. A couple of y'all still ain't sure whether you're honest or not. We don't fill that card out. Now, here's the question. Why does the manufacturer ask you to fill the card out and send it back to the company? They have no idea who you are. But you have their name in your hands. Sony, Mitsubishi, Habachi, whatever you have in your hand, you can. And they said, look, if you got our name, we want to know who you are. Send it back to us with all of your contacts. And what we're going to do is put you in our system so that there is a relationship between the company and the customer because the customer is carrying the name of the company god says look before you leave my presence and tell people you represent me make sure there's a relationship between heaven and you the reason why he gave you the holy spirit is just to make sure that you're still in touch with the company and the Holy Spirit is the authorized dealer who is there to tell you, don't do that, no, don't do that, no, the books say don't do that. He's there to make sure you keep the laws laid down by the manufacturer. This is why sometimes we hate the Holy Ghost. Because we want to do what we feel like. And he would tell us, thou shalt not. Now, what's amazing about products, the manufacturer says, this is a General Electric iron made by our company, General Electric. 
do not operate this iron in water do not stand in water while it is plugged in thou shalt not attempt to use this iron while you are bathing I know it sounds ridiculous but some folks are that stupid <laughs> now if you use the iron while you're standing in water the company cannot stop you God watches you mess your life up the Bible says when a man sins he does it out of his own lust we break laws because we defy the voice of the authorized dealer we ignore the instructions and the warning of the authorized dealer and therefore we experience failure ladies and gentlemen failure is not a mistake failure is a result success is not luck success is a result make a note of this please God wants you to succeed for his purposes in other words success is built in to the system so all creation is operational based on these inherent laws the reason why the theme this year is so important is because it's the next level of kingdom living after you enter a kingdom which is a country you must learn all the laws of that country if you become a citizen of any country your first obligation is to learn the laws of that country which means that you submit to the constitutional standards of that nation to enjoy the promised benefits of that country you cannot enter God's kingdom and violate God's law and expect God's favor we've been somehow believing that God will overlook or wink at our disobedience to his laws I put it to you that laws were given to guarantee success write that down why were laws given why were laws given to guarantee success success therefore is not an experiment God is so good he simplified life you want to harvest you plant a seed it's as simple as obedience to laws and the laws are so natural that they are literally supernatural because he has implanted in everything its own success my success and your success is determined already by our capacity to obey laws and I've seen people who try to succeed by violating laws it doesn't work I watch people over the years you know in my short lifetime we are 30 years old this year and the folks who came through this, through this ministry and I watch them and I say to myself I know your future I can see where you headed and they go off and they and they violate law and then you see them a few years later and their life is a wreck and you're like I could have told you that there's no luck and people come back and they say boy pastor Miles, you're still here sure I'm obeying laws I see people's lives improve I see people have progress they keep moving why they keep obeying laws of God others go in the opposite direction and they have in the same environment <laughs> but they're going in opposite direction because one is obeying law the other one is disobeying law and the results are predictable on both sides I put to you then that law is the priority now I want to ask you to write this list down very quickly the most important knowledge on earth is the knowledge of law the reason why you read the Bible is not for devotions you read it to learn the law of God devotions don't protect you from failure obedience to law protects you from failure praying over seed doesn't make it grow planting it in soil makes it grow 
uh, the laws are what you want to learn. Number two, the most powerful force on earth is law. I have, and I keep referring to the seed because it's the most simple example of law. Seeds are so powerful that once you obey the laws of seed, you put them in soil and you give them moisture, the power in the seed takes over. And a seed can break concrete. I've seen trees that destroy the sidewalk because the concrete got in the way and it pushed its way through the concrete and break it. You see, when you obey laws, everything life tries to put in your way, your obedience breaks it. So life is not about fighting concrete, it's about obeying laws. The laws automatically give you the power to break resistance to destroy hindrances. Life is not hard. Obedience is hard. Because obedience goes against our nature. We want to have our own way, do things, our own timing, and God says, you can't do it that way. Laws, number three, are inherent in creation. Number four, laws are necessary in creation. Necessary means you cannot live on this earth without obeying laws. This includes the animals, the plants, the planets, and the human. We all must obey law. That's why number one is so important. Learning the laws is the key to life. That leads me to number five. Law is essential to life. Number six, very critical. The key to success in life is law. Therefore, absence of law is the beginning of destruction. You take a mango seed which has a mango tree in it and you put it in a glass of alcohol. What happens? The tree is still in the seed, isn't it? But it is short-circuited because seeds were not created to live in alcohol. You know, when I grew up in Baintown, I met some people on the street as a kid. They were soaked in alcohol. You could smell them before they arrived. They drank alcohol at 8 o'clock in the morning. Then at 11 o'clock, they had a little reminder. 12 o'clock, they had lunch. Same thing. 5 o'clock, they had dinner alcohol. You know what I mean? I'm Bristol. We used to saw them. We saw them, right, Bristol? I mean, and, and you see them? And 5 o'clock, they wet. 8 o'clock, drunk. 10 o'clock, drunk. Even when they sweat, the sweat, they licked it. Their entire future was destroyed by a bottle. You see, absence of law guarantees destruction. When you leave this meeting today, you need to really take a review of your life. Look at the things you are involved in, the people you are with, the things that you are doing, the movies you are watching, the music you listen to. Just look at everything in your life and say, now, which one of these is violating this book? Because that is going to be your downfall. No one needs to watch you. You disobey God in secret, you'll publicly be disgraced. So it's not a matter of trying to sneak around God and trying to, you know, fool God and trying to fool the people and, and trying to, to, you know, uh, put a false impression on us. This, listen, don't waste your strength. Just live right. Amen. Some of you have been so abused already. You should have sense now. I mean, some, your life has been so messed up. It's like, I mean, how long? Listen, Solomon says, look. If a man makes a mistake, he should make it once. That's in the Bible. Now, you, you make a mistake twice, the mistake is smarter than you. How many times do we need to learn that you cannot violate law and succeed? There is no, no way out of, of doing something bad or something wrong. It has its own results. Write this down. God created life to function by law. So if you want to function, you need to learn the laws. 
The same way you study the manual, you need to study God's laws of life and obey them. Now, I want to say something very quickly. When you talk about teaching law, and I say this in every session, we become threatened by our concept of grace. And I want to warn us that we got to be careful not to confuse ritual laws of religion with the eternal laws of God. Let me just warn you that if we're going to become wise people, we must learn law. Law is inherent in life. Uh, here's something to remember. The knowledge of laws and principles are the source of wisdom. When you learn the laws, you become wiser than the people in, around you. I like what David says. David says, because I know thy laws, O Lord, I am wiser than my teachers, and I am greater than the elders, he says. And which means that if you are a young person at 20 years old and you learn more laws than your granddaddy, you are wiser than your granddaddy. Age doesn't make you smart. It doesn't make you wise. It makes you old. You can be an old fool. Tell your neighbor, I think he might be talking about you. Sometimes we get the idea that well, that person is 50 years old. Man, they must be very smart. No, they just got a lot of regrets. What makes a person wise is their knowledge of law. You know, some of you older people, not you, the one behind you, uh, you work on a job and you've been there for about 45,000 years. And here comes this young college graduate out of school in your department. And this is the age of computer and you've been there for 55 years. This kid comes out of college at 24 and they make him your boss. You are mad. Matter of fact, you think, who do they think they are? I've been here since Moses was here. I need to be appreciated. How dare they put this little whippersnapper over me? This little rat behind the ear, young boy, don't know what he's doing. And you mad, mad, mad. Now the problem is this, simple, simple. The kid spent four years learning law as a computer. You spent 50 years running from the computer. Computers don't operate on age. <laughs> I saw something interesting when I read the Bible over the years. Every time the children of Israel disobeyed God's laws, they went into captivity. Okay? The whole country is destroyed. Then God says, I will bring you back. God brought them back many times. When he brought them back, the first thing the king would do was tell them, find the scroll. Then the Bible says, he would open the scroll and read the laws of God again to start the nation again. In other words, when things go wrong, don't call for the psychiatrist or the psychologist. Go back and learn the laws of God. You will get your order back, your sanity back. You will get your confidence back. If you disobey law, you self-destruct. This is why when you know the laws of God, you become bold. You know, uh, here's that young 24-year-old college graduate walking around the office giving you instructions. So bold. Press that key. Now press that one, and you're like, who do you think you are? I've been here for 90 years. You've been here for nine days. The difference is his confidence is his knowledge of that computer. Write this down. Knowledge breeds confidence. Ignorance produces guessing. <laughs> Sometimes I look at my son typing, and I get mad. He typing fast. I'm like, two, two, two. <laughs> so when I want something to type, I say, type this. You need to learn laws so that you can be bold and confident. And then number three, very important, this one is critical. Wisdom is laws and principles applied. When you learn the laws of life and you apply them, people think you're wise. Well, that's why the Bible says uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of God means you are afraid to break his laws. 
I mentioned this before, I mention it again. The number one problem in the church around the world is a lack of fear of God. The reverence for God in the church has just about leaked out. We got folks in the pulpit who should be in jail. We got folks in the choir who should be behind bars. We got people who are on the organ who should be in an insane asylum. We, we got the mess in the church and everybody's still clapping saying amen. No fear of God. And I'm talking about big name people too today in the body of Christ. They have no fear of God. They mess up on Monday back in the saddle on Tuesday preaching. And no one is saying, sit down. You cannot preach anymore for a while. You messed up, okay? You need to be repaired. You need to be restored. Stop it. No one is stopping them. <laughs> Write this down. Laws and principles are more important than power. Because a person is in power, doesn't mean they can violate law. As a matter of fact, violation of law makes power illegitimate. You cancel your right to be in leadership if you violate law. There's no secret about that. Yeah, but he's the pastor, he's the bishop. Yes, but he messed up. Now he ain't bishop no more. He is fixed up now. He gotta get fixed. He, you know, we walk around because the person has a title or they've been in ministry for years. That don't exempt you. They violate law. And again, I'm, say, I'm saying this. I'm not attacking anybody. I, I'm trying to protect you and me. If we obey law, life works. If we disobey law, life shuts down. Let's have fun the next 10 years, okay? Let's work together and be law-abiding citizens. How about that? Give God a hand. That's what God wants. <laughs> law-abiding citizens. I, I thought it would be important to remind you the scripture again because we got those religious people who are watching me who say, well, Pastor Miles is getting into legalism. Pastor Miles is getting, you know, he's moving backward into law, the bondage, the bondage of law. You know, the, the Holy Ghost has delivered us from the law, and we are free from law. And, you know, I'm under grace, and grace has set me free. And, and we got folks who only preach grace, 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 grace. And grace has become a disgrace. Let's read what the Apostle Paul says about this danger of grace. Paul says, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, You, my brothers, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. I'm forgiven. Yeah, but walk right. He set me free to do right. Praise the Lord. Now walk right. Thank God for grace to live right. Look at the last part. He says, rather serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in this one, he says. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't use your freedom to indulge in the breaking of law. Matter of fact, some of y'all still don't get it. So first Peter, now Peter learned this very well. First Peter chapter 2 verse 15. Peter says, 16 rather. He says, live as free men. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Say it loud. Praise the Lord. Boy, we love freedom. Man, I'm free. Grace has set me free. Read the next part. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Now we got two different apostles speaking. And one of them we call the apostle of grace. Let me tell you something, Paul was an apostle of law too. He was against ritual religious law that put men in bondage, but he never spoke against the laws of God. I'm very concerned about us enjoying kingdom citizenship and attempting to disobey law. You cannot experience God's promises if you violate God's standards. God is good, but he ain't stupid. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, what I'm going to show you before we close is, 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 is the difference between, you know, uh, grace and law. Because they are very important. Look at Matthew 5. Jesus made law the priority. He just spoke about the kingdom in John 4 verse 17. He says, repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Everybody say amen. But then he says, he said, but do not think I have come to destroy the law. Jesus came to destroy religion, which is man-made laws attempting to get back to kingdom. He came to destroy that. But he didn't come to destroy the laws of God. Because they're built in. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. Write those two words down, please. Write the word law. Write the word prophets down. I'm going to show you those in a second. But I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Write the word fulfill down. I tell you the truth, he says, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter of the law will by any means disappear from the law until everything the law says you must do is accomplished. I didn't come to destroy the law. Now notice he says, do not think. Uh, very quickly, uh, write fast please, or just get the CD. This is important stuff here. The word do not think means do not consider. Do not imagine. Do not dream that I came to destroy the law. Do not assume. Do not suggest. Do not entertain the idea that I came to destroy the law. Do not conceive the thought. Now why does he say this? Because he knew that the minute you receive the grace of his sacrifice on the cross, you think you're free from law. I'm under grace. Yes. Grace was given so you could keep law. Not you don't obey law to get grace. You get grace to obey law. I was driving here this morning to this building. And I'm driving by myself this morning. Holy Ghost spoke to me very quietly. He said, tell the people that grace is ability to keep the law. The word grace is the word charisma, charisma in Hebrew, and it actually, and Greek rather, and it actually means giftings or enablement. It means power. That's why we even use the word char charisma for people who got energy, energetic personality. It means ability. The grace of God was given. So you could keep law because without the grace of God, you cannot keep the law. Grace doesn't replace law. It gives you the power to keep it. I grew up in a Baptist church. Please give me all the Baptists. My daddy's here. He's a Baptist preacher. Sitting right here. Daddy, I love you, you know. Daddy's one of the best preachers I know. He taught me how to teach. He's 86 years old next month. In May. Yeah. And he'll tell you that every altar call in the Baptist church, the same people go up. Anybody experience that? Let me see your hands. Wave at me. Come on, you Baptists. Wave at me. Yeah, you're Baptistites. Yeah, Pastor Henry, you know about that, right? Yeah. Why do we always go up? Because we sinned on Saturday night. We come right back up. Yes, Lord. Yes, please forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. I never open one eye. I, forgive me, Jesus. Why? Forgive me so I can feel better, so I can do it again next week. That's why we pray. That's why we got pray. In other words, we use the grace just in case we die before next weekend. <laughs> we we, we would use it. We say, God forgive me so I can sin again. That's what we did. We didn't keep no laws of God. And there are people who would have a party on Saturday in the night. I mean, they, they get stoned, they get wiped out, they have sex, but I mean, all kind of, of immorality. And then Sunday, they take in communion. They did, you know, they get, they, they get the incense. They, well, hey, the grace will cover me until next weekend. They don't understand. We wonder why we have hardship in our lives. God says, you, you break in every law in the book and then come back for a dose of grace every weekend. Your life is one big roller coaster. 
up on Sundays, down on Mondays, wrecked on Fridays, back up on Sundays. And the stress is so much, you have all kinds of problems in your body. You know, salvation is killing some people. <laughs> it's supposed to be saving us, but it's killing us because we are using the salvation to encourage our own destruction. Christ said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to destroy it or set it aside or invalidate it or to cancel or to eradicate it. He says, matter of fact, I came to do the opposite. Now the word law here, he's using is not religious law. He's talking about the original precepts, principles, standards, and inherent regulations established by the creator. Write that down. The laws he's talking about is the original standards established by God. The original precepts God created for all things to live by. God told Adam, do not touch that tree. That's a law. We constantly violate God's commands. The tree was not important. It was the command that was important. I heard people say, well, you know, the, the tree was a woman. The, the tree was this. The tree was that. Something that wasn't any tree at all. But listen, it, it's not the tree that was important. It was the command. The Bible says Adam disobeyed God. It didn't say Adam ate the fruit. He disobeyed God. Disobedience means you break the law of the word. The law is the original precept. It's the original standards God set. And Christ says, I, I didn't come to destroy them. Nor the prophets. Who are the prophets? The individuals who chose to declare those laws. God chose people throughout the centuries to keep on repeating those laws to us. We know their names, many of them. Moses was one of the chief ones who God gave a whole lot of laws to. And those laws are still good. I'm talking about the ones that are not ritual. God gave Moses some hygiene laws. Let me tell you something. If every government imposed in their constitution the hygiene laws of Moses, the health care system would be less stressed. For example, God told Moses, tell the people in this nation, this community of Israel, not to eat fish without scale. Okay, I'm getting in trouble now. I see it. Okay, okay. But, but, but watch God now. Now, Moses knows nothing about fish because they live where? In the desert. But God said, tell him this law. Don't eat any fish without scale. Now, do you know why? Every fish in the ocean today without scale have no protection against absorbing mercury. Fish with scale, the scale is a shield. The water is filled with poisons. What stops the poison is the scale. So any fish without scale, without scale, absorbs all the poison and the mercury, like catfish. I ain't gonna call no more names, cause you're, everybody watching me. Oh dear, Pastor Miles. Oh, please don't touch that one. <laughs> Some of y'all thinking I'm going to lunch in a few minutes faster. Don't touch that one. Okay, I'll just say this way. Any fish that has no scale, don't order it on the menu. Because that is where the mercury comes from. Mercury is the number one poison in the human body. And guess what they found out? It causes senality. Craziness. By the time you're 60, you wonder why you can't think, right? All that mm, fish you ate, and that mm, stuff you ate. <laughs> all the creatures that crawl on the bottom of the ocean absorb mercury mercury is a cause they say of many cancers in the body and it also increases iodine in the bloodstream iodine they say is the number one cause of dementia Dementia means they take you to Fox, I mean to a geriatric hospital, no, 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 the, the Sanderlands, and they keep you there. And guess what? You are eating yourself crazy because you violate God's simple hygiene law. I have not found one law that God ever gave Moses that's bad for national development. Imagine the price we pay for cancer. $200,000, $300,000 to try to keep somebody alive. You've been there with your mom. 
And God is saying, just don't eat the fish without scale, okay? He doesn't explain anything. He just says, don't, don't, don't do that one. He said, don't eat lobster. Now, you see, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, oh, Jesus. Oh, please. Oh, pray for me. Pray for me quick. Somebody pray for me. Please pray for me. Lord Jesus, pray for me. I need deliverance. <laughs> I'm trying. I really am. I'm trying. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know you all knew I was going to touch that somehow right here. <laughs> You should not eat shrimp. Jesus, Lord, help mercy. Coconut shrimp dipped in batter, fried. Oh, ah, thank you. <laughs> shrimp is filled with mercury. God says any animal whose hooves are split, don't eat it. Now you know we like poke chops. But if you study the pig, because the pig is constantly attached to mud, all of the parasites that are in the soil are in the, key, the pig's flesh. <laughs> oh, please, Lord, help me now. Oh, I'm in trouble. I know that barbecue ribs. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Lord, you know you got to ease up on that one. <laughs> but we wonder why we have high cholesterol we have colon problems then parasites can't get out they bury themselves in the muscles and they feed on all your substance from the pig <laughs> oh jesus i can feel it i can feel it come from the crowd i bind you pastor in the name of jesus okay <laughs> I try to buy myself too. I mean, I, once in a while I give in, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm doing better now. I'm doing better. I really am. I'm doing better. You know, I eat, eat ribs like twice a year. <laughs> and I try to make it beef, you know, try to make it beef. Beef at dawn split hooves, okay? So beef, beef is fine. Yeah. But watch them split hooves, okay? <laughs> Every law of God is scientifically sound scientifically sound if the science tell you the truth about everything God said they would change the diet of the country but you know that taste <laughs> that taste is something else that my wife got delivered a few years ago I, I, I still trying to get her anointing she don't eat any meat Sweetheart, I love you. Praise the Lord. Someday, someday soon, I'm going to cross over to you, baby. We're going to be one in the flesh. <laughs> I love my wife. Boy, I tell you, she, she all right. Until then, <laughs> the joy I'll carry on. <laughs> <laughs> the prophets kept repeating the laws and the people keep disobeying them and the country keeps going into repression the cost of health care today is a violation of God's law obesity is a result of the eating habits and what we eat and God is saying look let me save your national treasury just keep my laws and it's, it, it's tough you know you got that red light the red light is red and you got 150 horsepower under your feet that's hard man and no one's coming <laughs> you need the Holy Ghost to hold yourself on that brake some of y'all going from here straight to a buffet and there'll be chicken and pig and some interesting seafood come Jesus no don't don't touch come please don't touch the national pastime <laughs> I was trying to avoid bringing that up <laughs> the Bahamas has one of the highest cases of cancer in the entire world did you know that we are ranking up to I think it's the top four but dark where's dark it's high what is it someone know the figure we're like in the top four in the world. 
top three here because of our diet. Oh dear, can't take a deep breath, please. Say, Lord, forgive me. I will eventually obey this one. <laughs> All right, let me let me just bring this to, to a close. Watch this. Jesus said, I came not to abolish, but to what? Fulfill. I did this research for you. The word in the Hebrew that he used, it means to enforce. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to explain. The word also means in Hebrew to restore the meaning of something. In other words, I came to actually magnify the law, not get rid of it. I came to put, this is the best one, the spirit of the law back in the law. Now all the lawyers here know what that means. There's what we call the letter of the law, which is the document, and then the spirit of the law, which was the original intent of the law, the meaning of it. Christ says, I came to put the intent back in the law. I came to explain to you what it meant when I first said it. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to literally demand that you obey it. I came to demonstrate how it's supposed to be practiced. Jesus ate fish, scaled fish. No, we've been to Israel for over 22 years now. And every year we go to Israel, we go to the Sea of Galilee, every time. And we eat the same fish that was there for 2,000 years. And those fish taste wonderful. And they are scaled fish. That's the very fish Jesus ate. There's no catfish in Galilee. <laughs> catfish are called vacuum cleaners. They clean up the ocean. They clean up rivers. You use them as a vacuum. All the dirt is sucked into a catfish. And it goes into the catfish system, into its bloodstream and into its muscles. And that's what we eat. We call it flesh. Jesus ate fish, but it was scaled fish. He didn't just come to speak the law, nor replace it. He came to enforce it. So when, he, when we talk about living in grace and living in the kingdom of God, it doesn't mean that we are free from law. It, makes, it actually makes us more responsible to keep the law because we are back in God's graces. I put it to you then that this verse is an interesting verse. John chapter 1. Please write this down. Verse 17. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. You like that verse, right? In Him was life, and that life was the light, the light of every man to come into the world. Okay. Then it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld this glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth for the law was given through Moses okay fine but grace it says and truth came through who Jesus Christ the word grace means ability and truth means original meaning God sent to Moses with the law for the whole world he sent it through different prophets through the years to remind us and he also put it in nature matter of fact let me just say something very interesting about nature oh this is interesting when there was an argument about homosexuality and debauchery and, and immorality and arguments that Paul had with people, you know, concerning things like uh, lesbianism and being effeminate and all this stuff we're arguing about today. That's old stuff. Paul, Paul says, look. Paul says, look. This is deep, you know. Paul says, I don't need to quote any scripture to you all. He says, even nature proves that this ain't right. Do you all remember that? Oh, you all don't remember that? Okay. I know some of you all don't read the Bible, so I don't want to assume that. Romans chapter 1. Paul is talking about all these things he's fighting over today. You know, same-sex marriage and lesbianism and all this stuff. Paul says, look. He says, you don't need God to write something on the wall for you. Look at verse 18. The wrath of God is already revealed from heaven against all the godly godlessness. And wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's an important suppress the truth means I saw something on CNN yesterday, it still makes me sick thinking about it. A man who became a woman. So they claim. I think it says uh, her name was Steve or something like that. And I'm watching this program now. Don't turn the TV off, okay? And I'm sitting there thinking, 
what is this? Let me, let me read what it was. Verse 18. This is the Bible. This is exactly what you saw on CNN. It says, the wrath of God is already revealed against that. Men suppress the truth by their wickedness. You cut your penis off and call it a vagina. Now you know it ain't none, but you suppress the fact that it ain't none. You suppress the truth. The truth is you're a male, but you suppress it. You put some hormones and get a little bit of bubby, and now you're telling me you're a woman. You ain't no woman. Anybody with me here? They suppress the truth. The honest truth is I'm a male. What did I say? Oh, sorry. Boy, my bed uh, stuff comes out sometime. <laughs> tell your neighbor, tell the truth. Let me tell you something. All my homosexual friends, I love you guys and, and, and girls, lesbians. But you are simply dishonest. If you want to have that kind of sex, just say so. But don't try to convince us to sanctify it, sanction it, and give it dignity. Just say that's what you want to do, that's all. If you want to use an exit as an entrance, just tell me the honest truth. Don't try to get me to dignify it, sanctify it, glorify it, and then make it legal. This, this is crazy. You're suppressing the truth. The truth is, this is an exit. This is an exit. Nature say this is an exit. It's a garbage disposal. This gets rid of waste. Now, I ain't attacking nobody. Biology, simple, 101. Biology, 101. It's a law. The law of my rectum is excretion. It's a law. No legislation can transform that into something else. So if you see a fellow walking around with his wrist break, just say, tell him, legally, you are a brother. By law, you are a brother. Your walk don't cancel that law at all. Your earrings don't touch that law. Your, your relationship don't change that law. These are laws. So at least be honest with God. Tell God, I will violate your law. Okay? Thank you very much. That's honest. Be honest. What did I do? You're making me behave interestingly. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. Come on, all you young people, read this please. Verse 19, because some of you are getting tempted. Verse 19 says, sin. <laughs> Come on, I want you to read this in your Bible. Turn your Bible, Pastor Mark. I want you to read this. Bring this back to your mind now. It says in verse 19 of Romans 1, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them in nature, for since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. The dogs got sense. I've never seen two male dogs getting it on. And in Baintown, we got pot cakes. They, 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 they wild dogs. They still got sense. He said it's made plain through what? Creation. So that men are without excuse. See that? It's a law. These laws are built into nature. Oh, by the way, you might as well read the next one. For although they knew God, they go to church, hmm? take communion. Yes, they knew God. They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts are darkened. Although they claim to be wise, ooh, yeah, they have become fools and exchanged the glory of 
the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their own bodies with one another. Can I go a little further? They, ex they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And listen, man. God said, look, this is plain. You telling me it's legal and nature says it's illegal. Not me, nature says. Nature says this can't work. Two women cannot have children, okay? So let's just, you know, don't lie and tell me this what you, you are. You know, listen. Be honest. Now God already gave you over. So you have, you're going to self-destruct. But at least don't try to let, don't make all of us vote to support something illegal. And I say naturally illegal. Naturally illegal. This is why democracy is so dangerous. I am very suspicious of democracy because it makes laws based on majority, not based on what is right. If enough of us agree, we try to make wrong right. I want to also correct something I've been hearing for years in this country. The voice of the people is the voice of God. That's a lie. Because what you're telling me is if, if, enough of, if, if enough of us agree on something, it must be God's voice. Are you crazy? You need to act like Joshua. Joshua says, look, I don't know about you all, but as for me and my house, sometimes you got to go by your own self. Come on, give God a hand. God's voice may tell you walk alone. Don't let the majority convince you to do evil. Look at verse, hmm, verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations to unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women who were inflamed with lust for one another and men committed indecent acts. Am I reading the Bible? In these acts with one another, with other men, received in themselves, ooh, glory, received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion, the Bible calls it. Let me say something about this. I was talking to a gentleman yesterday in Washington, D.C., and this guy was connected to the government. And we were sitting in a room having a meal, and uh, the government, he says, you know, I was asking him to come and make some comments about the, you know, Washington just, just passed the bill this week of same-sex marriages. Okay, so folks are now getting married in the capital. So we got issues here with God, okay? Because when the head got it, you know, it, it only for a soul time, the rest body gonna get it. So anyhow, he said, they are asking me to come and make, you know, they're having a, a what they call a, a, a session where they're gonna debate a little bit of it. And he wanted my advice. I said, my advice is go in there and quote no scriptures. I want you to talk about nature. Because they expect you to quote scriptures as a pastor. Don't quote any scriptures. You talk about birds and peas and, and, and dogs and cats. Talk about nature. Embarrass them with nature. And I said, secondly, use the term perversion. Now, let me tell you what, you cannot pervert what is not real. I'm going to say this again. Perversion implies that there's something that is right that you have skewed to be wrong. It's perversion. You cannot take right and make it wrong. You can pervert it. So Paul is correct. Paul says it's perversion. Sex is good, but you can pervert it. You cannot pervert what is not present and what is not good. It has to be present first. Then you pervert it. It's like using a knife that you bought to slice tomatoes and you slice someone's throat. The knife is innocent, but you perverted the knife and made it a weapon. 
So, as a male, I am pure. And Pastor Richard is a male, he's pure. But we're not built to go together. But we can be... <laughs> Pastor Richard, don't worry about a thing. <laughs> but we can decide, this is the problem, to come together. That's called perversion of the male entity. Perversion. Now, if you try to sanctify perversion, dignify perversion, and then legalize perversion, it's impossible. Because it will never work. Two males cannot produce. Cannot. They can pass all the laws they want. They can, they can have operations. Surgery. It, they cannot. That's why they adopt. They borrow other people's products. And I'm concerned now that they're going to Haiti picking up kids to place them in environmental perversion and they call it adoption of the poor kids I call it the destruction of a generation we need to be careful about the laws of God let me close with this this, this gets too deep it says verse 28 furthermore since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God he gave them over to depraved minds. What is depraved? Depravity means that you have lost all sense of normalcy. You're no longer normal in your thinking. If your thinking is corrupt, your life is corrupt. That's why when you get involved in, in, in perversion, it's hard to get out because your mind becomes corrupt. And as a man thinketh, so it's not just deliverance you need. You need a transformation, mental transformation, which would take a long time. You have to unlearn what you've been learning. Your mind, he says, have been perverted, depraved. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness. Verse 29, and evil and greed and depravity. They are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. Now, I want you to think about the words Paul are using here. When a put perverted they become violent I hope you all get what I'm saying don't forget what I'm saying this is very important Paul says when a person is depraved they become violent they actually become murderous he says in other words they will fight to defend their perversion they will kill you they will they will make you lose your job they'll fire you if you talk against their perversion they become violent That's why many of these perverted groups are so dangerous. They will kill you. He says they, they are filled with all kinds of wickedness, strife and deceit and malice. They are gossips and slanders and God-haters. 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 I don't ever God. Leave me alone. Don't come with this God stuff around me. I'm enjoying my life. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. They, they, they hate God. Why do they hate God? Because if they love him, they got to do what he says. Christ says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So if you hate me, you don't got to obey them, see? 
hatred for God is what numbs the conscience to obey God look at the closure here he says God haters insolent arrogant Ooh, Paul must be around today arrogant coming out of the closet don't care what you say arrogant about it arrogant Paul said that's a sign of depravity and they got some folks around you know even in, in, in churches arrogant I mean I've seen some some, some situations where I don't want to talk about them but you know you see these pastors got the sweetheart sitting right there and then the sweetheart go up to them at the end of the service in front of the wife and hug the brother and everybody know and they all got hat on and everybody looking and I'm like sitting there going this is arrogance perversion how arrogant are you that's a sign of your depravity when you have no more shame you have lost the God consciousness if you sin at least be shame <laughs> you know when you get into arrogance you're getting into the, the dangerous zone of an apostate no fear of God let me tell you something I scared to commit adultery scared God will kill me so don't wink at me. I scared to wing back. I, 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 <laughs> what? If God don't kill me, that woman will kill me right there. It's, either way, I'm dead. You all think she said the quiet there? Bang, bomb, dead. <laughs> she will kill me and tell God he died. Don't know how he died. I found him here in the room. Watch this. I want you to see this verse 30. Slanderous, God haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways to do evil. There's some stuff God don't know about that we've come up with. God said, Where did you invent that way of doing evil? That's a new one. Verse 31. They are senseless. And they disobey the parents. I got a voice before that. Parents, they don't want no authority in their lives. Don't tell you what to do. I'm going to tell my mother today that I am a lesbian. I, have just, I don't care what my parents say. Disobedient to parents. Don't go out with those people. I don't, I'm 18 now, mama. Don't tell me what to do. That's a spirit of arrogance. You are bound for destruction. It's a loss. Paul says they are senseless, faithless, heartless. Paul, please quit. Rootless. <laughs> Rootless. That is spelled R U T H. Oh dear. Uh oh. No, the Lord, they made a mistake with that one. That, that's supposed to be R-O-O-T, Elia, I think. Because, you know, without her, I am rootless. <laughs> rootless means they will walk over you to do their evil. They'll wake up in the night and harass you to do evil rootless no sense verse 32 although they still know God's righteousness his decrees what's, what's the word decrees laws they know God's laws but those who do such things deserve death they not only continue to do these very things but also approve of those who practice them that means that they make now legislation to protect the evil they approve it approved no one can speak against this this evil is now normal it's part of our social culture we approve it 
If you get it through the courts, through the Senate, through the House, it's now proved that you can kill yourself. And that's what they're doing all around us. Can I suggest that this is one church that should never be silent? When evil begins to rear his head. I am telling you the truth. I'm, a, I'm ready to go to jail. Ready to stand before the Supreme Court. Because I figure all of them can meet him anyhow. And we can see what number do later. Obey God's laws. I say obey God's laws. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.